Hey there, and welcome back to another video on first language acquisition. Today I'd like to talk about pre-linguistic children and their pointing gestures. Now, pointing has a very special place in the early communicative skill set that young children have. And as we'll see, pointing is a lot less trivial than it may seem at first. Yeah? So it's about directing someone's attention. It's about sharing information. And in order for this to work, we need to have some idea of what might be new or interesting or relevant for the person that we're communicating with. Yeah? So quite often we point to something for someone else because we think that this thing we're pointing to might be interesting for them. Yeah? Let me give you an example. Here uh, you see my daughter again. You know her already from the last video. And in this picture she's about nine months old and she's pointing at something. She's pointing at a plane in the sky and you see that my gaze is actually in the direction of her pointing gestures. So she has succeeded in directing my attention to the thing that she's pointing to. Okay, um, now we may think of children's pointing gestures as requests or imperatives and that's quite often the case. Yeah, So the child wants something, they point to it, they expect you to get it for them. But crucially, this is not what's going on here. Yeah? So here, my daughter does not want me to get that plane out of the sky. Rather, she just wants me to know about that plane. Okay? She wants to share the experience thinking that, yeah, this is something that you might find interesting. So what this means is that pre-linguistic pointing is not only there for requesting, but it also has the purpose of directing others' attention. This, of course, brings up a question. Why is it that children want to direct someone else's attention to something or other? Yeah? Is it that they just want to bring about a certain behavior? Is it that they want praise or recognition or that you interact with them as a parent or a caretaker? Um, Mike Tomasello argues that there's actually something more to it. Yeah? He argues that children want to influence the thoughts of others, that they want to change the knowledge states of their fellow human beings. They want them to see and to know things. And then they further point to things that are interesting, that they want to share with the other person. Things like a plane flying in the sky, or they will point to a dead insect that looks kind of interesting, or they point to your shoes when you prepare to leave, helpfully reminding you that you need to put on shoes when you're going to leave the house. All of this illustrates a very basic point that's going to be the main issue for this video, namely that human communication is cooperative. We're volunteering information and we expect others to do the same. So if you have taken a class on linguistic pragmatics, you may actually be familiar with Grice and his cooperative principle. So cooperation is basic, to human communication and it's fundamental to the early communicative development of pre-linguistic children. Okay, the ideas that I'll talk about in this video have been discussed by Michael Tomasello in a different book than the one that you've seen in earlier videos in this series. This time what I have to say comes from a book with the title Origins of Human Communication and the specific studies that I'll talk about are described in chapter 4 which has the title Ontogenetic Origins, so basically the origins of communication in the development of the individual, that is, in the young child. So in this book, which I really recommend, yeah, it's a great read, uh, Thomas Eller develops a model of communication that differs from established ideas. Specifically, it marks a departure from the so-called code model of communication. In the code model of communication, we have a speaker and a hearer, and the model tries to explain how we get information from the speaker to the hearer. Yeah? So basically, information originates as a thought in the speaker's minds, and this thought then is encoded in a message, so that is, it is put into words, so to speak, and it goes through the channel of auditory or written transmission uh, as a message to the hearer who then has to decode it 
and who has at the end of the process the same thought that the speaker began with. There are many aspects of the code model of communication that you cannot really argue with, right? So there are speakers and hearers who have thoughts and who encode them in messages. And a message can be hard to understand when there's a lot of noise. And when I read something or when I hear something, I decode words into thoughts and all that. So this is something that we can take and accept, yeah? But nonetheless, we can criticize the code model of communication for omitting certain basic aspects of communication. And that is what Tomasello does. On this slide, you see a representation of Tomasello's cooperative model of human communication. And you see that this model integrates some of the aspects that we saw earlier in the code model of communication. But at the same time, there are many elements to this that are not present, that are not represented in any way in the code model of communication. Two elements that of course reappear are the speaker and the hearer. And of course, there are also these arrows that signify that there is a transfer of information from the speaker to the hearer and the hearer has to decode whatever the speaker had in mind. Now beyond that, uh, there are a couple of elements here that do not appear in the code model of communication. And the most important one of these would be that there is actually a common ground between the speaker and the hearer, and that communication is about knowing things together. Okay, so this is completely absent from the code model of communication, and Tomasello argues that this is actually fundamental, yeah, and should receive a prominent place in this model of communication. So there are four main points that I'd like to highlight about the cooperative model of communication. First of all, communicators create the shared intention of successful communication. If you and I are talking to each other, we want communication to happen. We want there to be successful transfer of information. Second, communicative acts are grounded in joint attention. If we are communicating, we are mutually aware that we have a common ground and a shared focus of attention on an object or a situation or an idea. Third, communicative acts are performed for pro-social motives. That is, we're volunteering information because it may be helpful or useful for one of us. And fourth, human communicators operate in all of this with shared assumptions. We know about the conventional norms of communication, and we also know that volunteering information in this way is beneficial for each of us in the long term. Now, to get back to children, all of this is already visible in the communicative behavior of very young children that are not using language yet, okay? So this video will be about four studies of cooperative communicative behavior in very young children, children between 12 and 18 months of age. And I will focus on studies that investigate pointing gestures. So a first study that we'll look at uh, investigates how children point to share attention and interest. A second study shows that children point to provide helpful information to others. A third study shows that children can point to things that are not even there, yeah, if that constitutes helpful information. And the fourth study shows how children use shared experience to interpret pointing gestures. Okay, so let's go. Children pointing to share attention and interest. How can you actually investigate that? Well, on this slide, you see a picture with an experimental setup. And here, there is the child between a parent and an experimenter. And on the opposite side of the room, there is a screen. And sometimes, just sometimes, something interesting happens. And whenever that happens, there's a chance that hopefully the child will point out that, look, there's something going on. Right, so the general setup of the experiment was like this. We have the child, the experimenter, and a parent sitting at a table interacting. So they're playing with toys that are uh, on the table here. And then something interesting happens at the curtain. Yeah, And the child points to the interesting thing. And then the crucial 
variable that is manipulated in the experiment is how the experimenter reacts to the child's pointing gesture. And there are four different types of reaction in this experiment. So the first type is the one that you might expect from a normal human being, namely joint attention. So the child points and then the experimenter repeatedly looks back and forth between the interesting event and the infant's face and the experimenter is also talking excitedly about the stimulus. Okay, So in the experiment there's a uh, character from Sesame Street, Grover, yeah? and so in the experiment the child would point and then the experimenter would say, yes, it's Grover, isn't that great? There is something interesting, finally. You get it. In the second condition of the experiment, the experimenter acknowledges the pointing gesture but crucially, the experimenter does not look at the interesting thing. Okay, This is the condition that is called face. The experimenter looks at the infant's face, never looking at the event, and talking excitedly, but only about the infant. So the child points, and the experimenter goes, yes, you're pointing, you're such a good pointer. And, um, well, you can imagine that the child is somehow not so happy with this reaction, despite the fact that the child is getting a lot of attention. In the third condition, the experimenter looks at the event following the pointing gesture, but then she doesn't look back to the child and doesn't speak excitedly about it or show any emotions about it. In other words, she's bored by the interesting event that the child so helpfully pointed out to her. In the fourth condition, which is the ignore condition, the experimenter only looks at her hands, never looking at either the infant's face or the event, so basically no communication whatsoever. Okay, these are the four conditions, and what the experimenters measured was how long did the child point to the interesting thing. On this slide here you see the results, so there's a bar chart with four different bars, and each bar represents one of the experimental conditions and you see that the joint attention condition yeah, where the experimenter reacted with joint attention to the child's pointing gesture that's when the pointing gesture was held the longest time. Yeah? What I find kind of interesting about these results is that the face condition where the experimenter reacted to the child and gave the child a lot of attention didn't really uh, elicit pointing gestures that were much longer than the complete ignore condition or the bored experimental condition. Yeah? So um, the child is expecting joint attention. So going back and forth between the interesting thing and the other person. If that is not there, then the pointing gesture is considered as not useful and the child doesn't continue doing it. There was another measure that the experimenters took, namely how often the child would look to the experimenter's face. So again we have a bar chart with the four different conditions here and you see that the condition in which the child looked to the experimenter's face the most was actually the one where the experimenter wasn't really excited about the interesting event. So here the experimenter was looking and the child was sort of expecting them to be excited about Grover. Yeah? So they kept looking to the experimenter's face, even though the experimenter themselves were not interested, were not particularly excited. Okay, so what this means is that children want to communicate. They want to share information. They're not satisfied just by getting attention. It has to be attention for the right reason. That is, you and I are looking at something interesting together. We're mutually aware of it, and we want to share that experience. Yeah? If, on the other hand, the communication partner is unresponsive, then children give up. They do not point as long, or they do not point at all on future occasions. Right, so you might say that, well, children, they point when there's something interesting going on that they want to share with a partner, but do they also point at things that are not interesting but only relevant for their partners? This is something that has been investigated in another study that I want to present, where children point in order to provide helpful information. The experiment was designed in such a way that the children were sitting on their parents' lap, and there was an experimenter who showed and named different objects. So for example, a pen, glasses, and a necklace. 
And then the experimenter accidentally dropped an object, pretending not to notice that they dropped it. Okay, so after a while, then the experimenter pretended to realize that something was missing. Okay, so oh, I only have the pen and the glasses. Where's the necklace? And they started looking around. Yeah, so they were pretending that they were searching for the necklace, and they even made an open hand gesture to the child. The measure in this experiment was: Does the child point to the object that has fallen down? Okay, do they point to the necklace in order to help the experimenter looking for that thing? And indeed, most children, more than 70%, did point helpfully in order to help the experimenter. Now, with this experiment, you could argue that a thing lying on the floor is still, in a way, more interesting than anything else that's going on. So the child is not caring about what's going on in other people's minds, but they're just concerned about something that is uh, noteworthy. So the researchers created a second version of the experiment in which the child has to selectively point to something that is relevant for the other person. In this experiment, the children were again sitting on their parents' lap, and there was an experimenter who showed and named a pair of objects that they were working with. So this is a hole puncher, this is a cardboard box, these two objects were introduced, yeah? And then the experimenter used, let's say, the hole puncher to punch holes into paper. That was their work. And then that experimenter left, and a different experimenter came into the room, and displaced these two objects. So they were hiding the hole puncher and the cardboard box somewhere in the laboratory. And once the first experimenter came back, um, this experimenter pretended to realize that something was missing and they started looking. So uh, the crucial measure in this experiment is where does the infant point? Does the child point to the object that the experimenter used to be working with, or do they point to the distractor? Yeah. So if their reasoning is that, well, the experimenter was using this thing to punch holes into paper, so they're probably going to want to do this some more, then that would be a motivation to point to the hole puncher. And if they just thought that, well, any of these objects that were hidden are good enough, then they might as well point to the cardboard box. So what did they do? Um, most of the time, the children were pointing to the target object, the one that the experimenter had actually been working with. So this is true for 12-month-olds, yeah, and it's more true even for children who are 18 months old. So more pointing to the target object across two age groups. This means that children point helpfully even if the object is not particularly interesting or new to the partner, the object just needs to be relevant for the partner. So the hole puncher and the cardboard box, in a way, they're not really all that interesting. Yeah? And even to the experimenter, they're old information, but the child still points to them as these objects are relevant to their partner. So children monitor the partner's attention and pointing is selective if one object is more relevant than another possible candidate, then children will point more often to that relevant object. Okay, I'm coming to the third study that I would like to present, in which children point to things that are not there. So as adults, we sometimes point to things that are not there or not right. For example, I can point to a plate on a table where, for example, a fork is missing, and through my pointing, I communicate that, look, there is a fork that we should put there. Now, the question for this experiment is, can children do that too? So the experiment was set up in such a way that the infants were sitting on their parents' lap, and across from them, there was an experimenter. And behind the experimenter, you see there's this contraption with a screen, and there are flaps in the screen to the left and right of the experimenter. And sometimes something interesting is going on with those flaps. Yeah? So sometimes there's a puppet that appears either to the left and right of the experimenter, and then the experimenter turns around. There are two conditions. Either the experimenter turns around to the correct interesting side, 
or the experimenter turns around to the wrong side. Yeah? And then the experimenter reacts. And again, there are two conditions. So this is a two by two design with four conditions in total. So either the experimenter would get all excited. Yeah? So for example, they would turn around the correct side, see the puppet and get excited. Or they would react in a neutral way. That is, they would turn around, see the puppet and go, oh yes, a puppet. Well, that's not so interesting. After that, the experimenter would face the child for 20 seconds and during that time the puppet would still be there but after the 20 seconds it would disappear that is it would go back to the other side of the screen just to summarize that so here we see the experimenter turning around to the interesting thing so this would be the attend event condition so the experimenter would actually look at the interesting event uh, sometimes the puppet would show up on the other side and the experimenter would still turn around in this way. So this condition is called the attend screen condition. So the experiment will really only see the screen. And after that, the experimenter would be facing the child. And after a while, the puppet would, um, well, go back and uh, disappear behind the screen. Now the question is, what does the child do then? Do children point towards the place where the interesting thing disappeared? Do they point at things that are not there? Okay, here are the results. Uh, again, we have a set of bar charts. The first chart is about the child pointing at the puppet while it's actually visible. And the second chart is the more interesting one. It's about the child pointing at the screen when the puppet has just disappeared. So what we see in the first graph is that there are more points. Yeah? So the y-axis is the mean number of points that the child makes. So uh, the child points more when the experimenter looks at the screen. That is, when the experimenter looks towards the wrong side, the child makes more pointing gestures, trying to get the experimenter to focus on the interesting puppet rather than the boring screen. Um, let's maybe focus on this condition here. So the experimenter is positive and the referent is there, but the experimenter looks towards the wrong side. Okay, so that is when the child is really excited and goes, no, 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 you're not looking at the right thing. Try the other side. Yeah, so that's how this bar can be explained. Now let's look at the second set of results here. In uh, this condition, the referent is no longer there, the puppet has just disappeared, and the experimenter is neutral <clears throat> and had looked at the referent. So in this case, there are relatively few pointing gestures. So the child seems to realize that, okay, the experimenter wasn't interested in the puppet when it was there, so she probably doesn't care that it is gone now, so I won't be pointing too much. Yeah? Now, by contrast, if the experimenter is looking at the screen, yeah, so the puppet has just disappeared, the experimenter looks at the wrong side, and as a consequence is neutral in her response, the child goes, no, 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 the interesting thing was on the other side, and now it's gone. Yeah? So the results show that the child is sensitive to the experimenter's reaction, and towards their behavior. So children understand what information is new and what information is old. They point more when an adult is not yet attending to an interesting thing that might be of interest to them. And children try to direct the partner's attention to something that the child assumes they will find interesting. And they monitor what their partners find interesting or not. So even when you're only 12 months old, you have an idea of uh, when you have a subject that your partner finds interesting. Right. This will become relevant again in the last experiment that I want to discuss here, where children use shared experience to interpret pointing gestures. Um, now we've just seen that children are sensitive to the mental states of others, but what do they actually know? about those mental states. What exactly is it that they monitor? 
this has been investigated in an experiment where infants use shared experience to interpret pointing gestures. Now some pointing gestures are very easy to interpret. If someone points at a piece of chocolate, I can safely assume that that means, okay, give me some of that. But quite often there are pointing gestures that are much more difficult to interpret. So if someone points at the window, do they mean that there's something interesting going on behind the window? Do they want me to open it? Uh, do they mean it's open and I should close it? So there are all these possibilities that I somehow need to figure out. So I need to determine what is our shared focus of attention and how should I be interpreting that uh, pointing gesture. So this experiment tries to examine how children can do this. And in the experiment, uh, there is a child and a first experimenter who we'll call the puzzle guy because experimenter one plays a puzzle with the child. Here you see it, uh, it might be very small on your screen. And uh, there's a final piece that is missing. So uh, the experimenter and the child cannot complete the puzzle and the experimenter leaves. And then there's a second experimenter coming in who we'll call the cleanup guy because this experimenter plays a cleanup game with the child. And uh, so they're cleaning up a mess that is in the room. And then finally, this experimenter places the so-called target object in the middle of the room. This target object has in fact a special significance because it is in fact the last missing piece of the puzzle that the child has been playing with the puzzle guy earlier. Okay, so the cleanup guy places the target object in the middle of the room and that very moment the puzzle guy comes back in. It's, it's like a sitcom somehow, yeah? And uh, then there are two conditions in the experiment. In condition one, the puzzle guy looks at the child and points at the target object. Yeah? <clears throat> There's our final piece. And in the other condition, the cleanup guy points at the target object and looks at the child, implying that, well, shouldn't we clean this up? Yeah? And the question then is, how does the child react? What does it do with the target object? So in a way, we have the same situation, someone pointing without any words at the same object, but the pointing gesture can be interpreted to mean different things. Now the question is, how does the child interpret this gesture? Here you see the results. There are two sets of results, one for a group of 18-month-olds and one for a group of 14-month-olds. And uh, there are two groups of bars in each graph. One is for the puzzle guy pointing and one is for the cleanup guy pointing. Now, let's look at the 18-month-olds first. And uh, this large black bar here is the puzzle guy pointing and the child putting the target object into the puzzle. So when the puzzle guy is doing the gesture, more than 70% of all children interpret that gesture as, look, here's our piece that we can finally put into the puzzle and that's what the children are doing. Um, conversely, if the cleanup guy is pointing, then almost 70% of all children put the target object into the cleanup container. Now, you notice that uh, the children aren't at 100%. So when the puzzle guy points, we still have more than 15% of children cleaning up the piece of the puzzle. And conversely, we have, well, almost 20% of children remembering the puzzle and putting it there. Well, it is a kind of cleanup that they're doing there. And, um, well, <clears throat> also a significant chunk of children are just doing anything that is not related to cleanup or playing the puzzle. Right, so these are the 18-month-olds. Uh, when we look at the 14-month-olds, we see that most of them actually are doing something else. So this ability of interpreting pointing gestures against a common ground is something that seems to emerge between 14 and 18 months of age. So here we have a lot of random acts of doing stuff with the target object. What the experiment tells us is that children draw on previous shared experience, common ground with other people, uh, to interpret pointing gestures. And they treat the same gesture differently depending on who is doing the pointing and what that person has been doing with the child earlier. 
So this means that shared experience and shared intentionality is at the basis of understanding something deceptively simple like pointing gestures. So in summary, young children between the age of 12 to 18 months show cooperative communicative behavior in that they point in order to share attention and interest. They point in order to provide helpful information that needn't be new or exciting for the child themselves. Um, they can point to missing entities. So that means they monitor what another person knows and what they expect. And they can use shared experience to interpret pointing gestures. That's it for today. For next time, please continue reading Tomasello. Uh, the next part is again a bit shorter, so 262 to 281, it should be doable. Uh, there's a quiz to go with it, online quiz number 12. Please be sure to fill that out, and I'll see you all next time. Bye.